DiscerningHearts.com presents That All May Be One, a Holy Week Retreat with Monsignor John Essif and Sister Cora Immaculata Heffernan. Monsignor Essif is a Roman Catholic priest in the Diocese of Scranton, Pennsylvania. He's lived in areas around the world serving the Pontifical Missions, a Catholic organization established by St. Pope John Paul II to bring the good news to the world, especially to the poor. He is a founding member of the Pope Leo XIII Institute, which trains priests in the areas of exorcism, deliverance, and healing. He has served as a retreat director and confessor to St. Teresa of Calcutta. He continues to offer direction and retreats for the Sisters of the Missionaries of Charity. Often he leads those retreats with Sister Cora Immaculatum Heffernan, who is a member of the Sisters Servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. She holds several degrees from Marywood, Notre Dame, and Syracuse universities. She's an accomplished musician and artist, as well as a counselor and spiritual director. We now offer this special presentation, That All May Be One, a Holy Week Retreat, with Monsignor John Nesif and Sister Cora Maculatum Heffernan. I would love to just give us the joy of the Immaculate Heart of Mary as we begin this Easter morning. And that power and that grace that comes through her, I would encourage us that the first one who saw Jesus on the morning of Easter was Mary. She was the one who buried him and she was there And when she went home after she buried him on Friday, and then she went and spent all day Saturday, her immaculate heart was very consoled by his words because she was the only one in the entire world and the church that remembered them. And that was, he said he was gonna suffer and he was going to die. But then he said, I will rise on the third day. So for Mary, even as she sat at home with those bloody rags on Saturday, and even on Sunday morning, she realized that he was going to arise on Easter. And so her immaculate heart was anticipating the joy of Easter, even on Saturday night and Sunday morning, especially. Her heart began to beat because for her, it was not if he will rise, but it was when and how. And mystics we have to rely on to tell us what happened with Mary's heart, that very early in the morning, about three o'clock, Mary was visited by the angel who came to her, and she is the queen of the angels. And he came to her and said, Mary, your son needs you. And she rose and immediately went to the tomb. And there, the angel rolled back the stone and she entered into, and there he was trying to get out of his shroud. Do you remember when Lazarus was trying to get out of the shroud when Mary was there with Jesus and he raised him from the dead? And he, Jesus said, help him get out of that. Well, that's what she did. She took the shroud off him and she laid it down exactly where it was on Easter morning and peace that covered his face. And here he was, the risen Lord, the first one to see Jesus risen from the dead was his mother. And not only do all mystics tell us about this, so many of them confirm this truth. And the only biblical sense 
that we have of it is the shrine as it lay there folded as any mother would this magnificent relic that we have of Jesus suffering and death so that now I would like to hear the words of sister with Pope John Paul II as he tells us as our Holy Father about Mary and her visit with Jesus on Easter morning. St. John Paul II wrote a beautiful, beautiful sermon. It was a, a talk that he gave to the General Assembly, but in it, he spoke about Mary being the first witness of the resurrection. She was a witness to the whole Paschal mystery. And in 1977, these are the words that he spoke. After Jesus was laid in the tomb, Mary alone remains to keep alive the flame of faith, preparing to receive the joyful and astonishing announcement of the resurrection. The expectation felt on Holy Saturday is one of the loftiest moments of faith for the mother of our Lord. In the darkness that envelops the world, she entrusts herself fully to the God of life. And thinking back to the words of her son, she hopes in the fulfillment of the divine promises. Even though it is non-scriptural, that this event is really the first one who sees Jesus risen from the tomb, that it was Mary, his mother. She was there at his birth, and now she's there at his resurrection. The truly one that I see that gives us the joy of Jesus, and, and especially with regard to this particular Easter, so many of us this Easter are so downcast with the COVID, with the sufferings that are going on all around us. Many of us this Easter morning are just somewhat like those two apostles and two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And they're very, very downcast. The thing that gives me the sense that this is the one that most kind of is like. The people of God seem so downcast, even this Easter. Last Easter, we, we went through the COVID. And this Easter, what, what seems to be so uh, unjoyful that God sees us and, and draws up near us so that we hardly recognize that it is the risen Lord. This account in Luke's gospel, Christ is risen, just as he constantly in his Paschal mystery, he suffers, he dies, and he rises. And now he greets these downcast men as they are going from Jerusalem and away to Emmaus. And they thought he was the one, but it really wasn't true. And so listen to this account. This account in Luke 24 is really beautiful. He writes of the appearance on the road to Emmaus. Now on that very day, two of them were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus. And they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, Why, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped looking downcast. One of them named Cleopas said to him in reply, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, what sort of things? They said to him, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, 
who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, how our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it's now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and they did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And he said to them, oh, how foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all of the scriptures. And as they approached the village to which they were going, he gave them the impression that he was going to move on farther. But they urged him, stay with us, for it's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem where they found gathered together the 11 and those with them who were saying, the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Everyone who is at mass this Easter morning and everyone who is anticipating going to celebrate the Eucharist has experienced in his heart. If you are baptized, if you are confirmed, if you are married, if you have received the Eucharist, then living and in you is the Christ, the living and beautiful presence of God on earth. That truly Christ is risen. He's in each of our hearts, and especially you who are one with him in baptism, in confirmation, in Eucharist. He truly is in you, and he's greeting your family. He's greeting your family around the table as you are going to teach them the scriptures that truly Jesus had to suffer had to die before he was going to rise. The Paschal mystery is constantly taking place in each of our lives. If you are a Christian, then there must be suffering. There must be death and there will be resurrection. As you look back at your life, every single Christian can account for being betrayed being lied about, being deceived, being abandoned. It, it's part of your, a part of our lives as Christians. And then loving and overcoming this by forgiving. The constant love, suffering, and death, and then the resurrection. You see, the constant mystery of Christ is taking place in each and every Christian life. And he always rises from the dead. There's always the resurrection. And so we know him in the breaking of the bread. But especially do we know him. Do we not realize that our hearts are burning within us as he walks along the road with us? 
we are one with him, in him and through him and with him. When the priest at mass is celebrating with us and we are gathered with our bishop, our priest, and we are there one at mass where we meet together. And even if you're watching it on television or whether you see it this Easter morning, Christ is risen. And as you hear the priest sing these words, through him and with him and in him, O oh God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. And we answer, Amen. Alleluia. He is alive. And we knew him in the breaking of the bread. That as we come together, even at our dinner table, there he is among us. Christ has suffered. Christ has died, Christ has risen. There are those who this Easter morning will meet him as Mary did. Not Mary, the mother of Jesus, but Mary Magdalene. And so let's listen to this account as this beautiful, loving Lord is met by her on Easter morning. In John uh, 20, there's a beautiful account of the appearance to Mary Magdalene. But Mary stayed outside the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she bent over into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting there, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken my Lord, and I don't know where they laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus there, but did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? She thought it was the gardener and said to him, sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you laid him and I will take him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, stop holding on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and tell them, I'm going to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and what he told her. Can you see how in the, this encounter, Jesus, the living Lord, meets someone who loves him dearly. She throws herself at his feet and she clings to him. What does he tell her, Mary? And this beautiful encounter of this loving person wanted and wants this union with our Lord. And he says to her, Mary, I even want to be closer to you than stop clinging to me. This desire to want me and to stay this way, this is not really who we are to each other. I want to even be closer to you than you're touching me and you're being with me. I want to be within you. And even this morning, there are those Christians who are one with Jesus. They love him so much that like Magdalene, he says to them, and this only can happen on, and what he tells Magdalene, Go tell my brothers that I have been seen by you and I'm going to appear to you 
for this next 40 days. And then I am going to have to leave, as I told you, and go back to my father. And then I will send the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, the Holy Spirit upon you, then we will be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. The union that I want with you, Mary, is that I want to be in you and with you so that you will carry me around in your heart, in your whole being. For the rest of her life, Magdalene was one with Jesus. She became him and he became one with her. And so it will be in each encounter that is there with Jesus over these 40 days that he spends with them. There's a beautiful account, especially with the apostle Thomas in this very same chapter of John that where you look and see that Christ is so in love with Thomas that he comes back after he visits. And can you read that account for us, sister? Thomas called Didymus, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the nail marks and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, a week later, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and bring your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. That believing, beloved brothers and sisters, that believing is just the beginning. We want so deeply to touch him, to sense him, to be with us. But he even wants more to be with us. So Thomas was able to actually put his fingers into the wounds of Jesus hands. He actually took his hand and put it in the hole of his heart. He wanted to, there's, there's, a, there's a, a beautiful Caravaggio uh, portrayal of this scene where he takes his hand and puts it right into his side. That, you see, opens eye, the eyes that this is really Jesus out here. God, in his love for us, Jesus, in his suffering and dying and rising from the dead, this day of resurrection is everything that he wants to have in us. He wants to suffer and die and rise in us and through us and with us. He wants to be Thomas. He wanted to be Magdalene. And that's what each of you have that are baptized, that are confirmed, that have received. When you go to mass, you actually eat his flesh and drink his blood because you have been baptized. You have been made one with him. Isn't this the reality that we are him and he is in us? how foolish you are, then Thomas gets to know him, not by touching him only, not by seeing him, by, by, all, by that encounter with him, but 
even more so by his baptism, by his confirmation. And the day the Holy Spirit came upon him and transformed Thomas into Jesus. And Thomas becomes Christ and went out and did what he did. But the day that you were baptized and today on this Easter day, you and Christ are one. What a beautiful story today is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sister's going to tell you about these same downcast men who are in a boat. And he's going to show them in a magnificent way by a great miracle as they are fishing and they hear and see him as he comes to them. In chapter 21 of John's Gospel, uh, he records the appearance to the seven disciples. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Together were Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we also will come with you. So they went out and got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. When it was already dawn, Jesus was standing on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, have you caught anything to eat? They answered him, no. So he said to them, cast the net over the right side of the boat and you will find something. So they cast it and were not able to pull it in because of the number of fish. So the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tucked in his garment for he was lightly clad and jumped into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat for they were not far from shore, only about a hundred yards, dragging the net filled with fish. When they climbed out on shore, they saw a charcoal fire with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you just caught. So Simon Peter went over and dragged the net ashore full of 153 large fish. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come, have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they realized it was the Lord. Jesus came over and took the bread and gave it to them. And in like manner, the fish. This was now the third time Jesus revealed to his disciples after being raised from the dead. What a magnificent scene this is. These disciples of Jesus are going to experience something that is, is so, he, he, he shows them himself, risen from the dead. I have suffered, I have died, and now I'm alive. I am the Son of God, the living God who has come down from heaven, and I have come so that I may be your salvation. And it is not just by being out here, on out of, of you, but it is going to be by being within you. And this magnificent catch of fish is, is like, he, he shows them this miracle. They are, they are fishermen. They haven't caught anything all night. And so they, they throw their net in at, at his voice, tell him to throw your net over the right side of the boat, and they drag in this huge catch of fish, and they bring it into shore, and 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 they and, and it's the Lord, Simon Peter hears from John, and he jumps into the water as kind of braggadocio. Peter always did something. 
kind of bizarre. And they bring in the boat and he drags in this the, the load of fish and they didn't stop. Uh, they count them 153 uh, fish. So they were enough and good sized fish and he, he, he begins to get, feed them breakfast. What a magnificent miracle that is. But the deepest thing is they didn't recognize him. You see, we don't recognize Jesus in each other. And especially as we, as we go to mass. When I was at the cathedral yesterday with, with the bishop and here we were as priests of Jesus Christ around the altar at this mass. And here Jesus is in our midst. He is in the bishop. He is in the priests. He is in me. And we had mass together. And when you have a celebration of the Eucharist, at your local church. He is in us, just as he was that day. He was in himself. He had to go back to heaven to send the Holy Spirit upon them to transform them into a deeper, unique, specific, irrepeatable Christ in each one of them. And he has done so with us. And he wants to do so with every human being on this planet. And on this Easter day, he is risen from the dead. And he actually not only gives us fish to eat, he gives us his own body his own flesh, his own blood to drink. We have become one with him through baptism, through confirmation, through the Eucharist that we receive, through the spiritual communion that we take in. Christ and I become one. Christ and you become one by the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God the Father. And what an Alleluia we can all sing on this Easter day. Alleluia. Not only does he come into us, but he lives in us. He dies in us and he rises in us. His suffering is dying and is rising, takes place in each of us. Each and every day, we can glorify God the Father through him and with him and in him. I think one of the biggest and most encouraging of all the miracles is Peter, who is the Pope himself. And you know, Joe, Jesus chose him, and that encounter that Peter has on Easter day and with, with Jesus. And so here is a, is a magnificent story of the resurrection and how it affects the first Pope. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Then he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then he said to him a third time, Simon, Son of John, do you love me? Peter was distressed that he had said to him a third time, do you love me? 
And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Amen, amen, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to dress yourself and go where you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress, dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. He said this, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had said this, he said to him, follow me. I had a scripture professor once who would, uh, wanted to prove to us that Simon Peter wasn't converted. You know, you think what, what he had been through uh, had converted him, that he had denied Jesus and now he sees him living. No, that, that really never, Peter kept all his faults. I really believe in some way that Peter was still uh, under the power of Satan right up until Pentecost, right in this same encounter, you know, that he's having with Jesus. When Jesus said, follow me, and he immediately, because he knows that what Jesus did was go to the cross, and he was terrified of that. And, and that's, that's exactly how he, how he died on that Palatine Hill. He, he died, but he wasn't afraid. Now, he could gladly give his life in union because he was one with Jesus. He became transformed on Pentecost, not till Pentecost, not even right here in the garden because he looks up and he sees John. He said, well, what about him? And, he, <laughs> and it was known among the apostles that John wasn't going to die. The only one who didn't suffer martyrdom was John. And so God spared, but all the others suffered martyrdom, including Peter. So they, they suffered, they died, and they rose from the dead. This is the story of Jesus and following him. Do you want to become one with Jesus? Yes, I do, Lord. Well, then you must suffer. You must die and you must rise. The union with Christ comes at the expense of being one with him and going through. He tells us right it all the time. Unless you become one with me, and I will show you the way. Salvation comes through, with, and in Christ. And on this Easter day, we see that he leads us, yes, into Calvary. And Calvary will lead us into resurrection and glory. And so, as we have this celebration of Easter. And in the, on this Easter day, I ask sister to help us reflect in this retreat as we complete it today, how we are to spend today in union and in celebration on this retreat. It's such a beautiful day. During these holy days of Holy Week, um, you've walked with Jesus and Mary and the disciples and the friends of Jesus and the enemies of Jesus. You've walked with him. You've heard his voice and you've experienced his passion and his death. And today, that glorious resurrection, you've been on a journey with him. And if we were just even to go back and uh, look at even the scriptures that we referred to today, of uh, each of the encounters with uh, the risen Christ. Um, uh, look to see, is there one that is a favorite one for you? Is there one of those passages where you found your hearts inflamed the way of the heart of, of the two disciples on the way to Emmaus uh, were? How about when uh, Mary Magdalene heard Jesus just pronounce her name? Uh, when you think of Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, 
meeting him first. Uh, she is such a beautiful woman of faith. When you go to Mass today, whether it's Mass that is virtual uh, and, uh, and you haven't been able to gather with the group uh, physically, uh, that's a very difficult uh, experience, but that might be your experience. And yet, uh, surround yourself with the angels and the saints and uh, even the souls in purgatory and all of those who are uh, physically present at the Mass. Just join yourself with the glory and the joy of the risen Christ. And when you receive communion today, either spiritually or physically receive his body and blood in the, in the uh, host and, the, and his precious blood in the wine, when you receive, will you feel that tremendous surge of God's love for you individually, that he is just wrapping his arms around your heart and around you. He so loves you. So think back to what stirred in your heart and uh, how did you speak to Jesus from your heart and what was he saying to you? Because that's the way he speaks with you. He wants to be with you. He wants you to trust him and to love him and to speak to him. And there is one way, I believe, that today you can do it. If you recall, every single time that Jesus met with the disciples and that, and even at the Last Supper, it was over a meal. And perhaps over the past months, you've been able to gather around your family table more than the year before that or other years before that because you were at home and your children were at home and your wife was there and your husband was there and brothers and sisters were there. When you gather, uh, there is always the presence of Christ, the presence of Jesus. And so around your family tables, uh, if you come into this practice once again of really sharing meals together, meals where there is love for one another expressed, where there is gratitude for what you've received, uh, that is such a beautiful way of uniting and being one. At the beginning of this retreat, one of the things that we said was that it was going to be uh, around the theme as that, that all may be one. And if you start with your own family, husbands and wives, <clears throat> children, <clears throat> relatives, uh, friends, people in the neighborhood, if there is that unity among you, uh, find ways to touch the person that's lonely who might be down the street to visit somebody, to call someone. Find ways that you can unite as one, that you can feed people spiritually through your, your love and concern for them and your expressions of affirmation and love and, and gratitude. There are so many beautiful ways that so simply we can reenact that beautiful meal uh, at which Jesus called every one of us to be united. Uh, I, I hope too that over these next weeks and at various times, you might revisit the scriptures and the passages and these talks that we have given, revisit them. Uh, and find where you were singularly touched by God. Spend some quiet time with Jesus. Talk with him, listen to him. Believe that he really wants union with you. Mother, father, son, daughter, uh, brother, sister, grandparent, uh, one another. 
he wants each one of you to uh, be united with him in this very simple, beautiful way of prayer. And then prayer for the whole world, that all of us may be one body, one Christ in the world today. So rejoice and be glad. This is the day the Lord has made. Yes, the Lord has made Easter. He has risen. Alleluia. And the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to That All May Be One, a Holy Week retreat with Monsignor John Essif and Sister Cora Maculatum Heffernan. To hear and or to download the podcast for this particular conference, visit discerninghearts.com. This particular conference can be viewed on discerninghearts.com as well as on the Discerning Hearts YouTube channel. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. We hope that if this has been helpful for you that you will first Pray for our mission, and if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com. God bless.